Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Julie Watkins, and I will be helping with today's travelogue brought to you by the Geographic Society of Chicago. Uh, since 1898, the Geographic Society of Chicago has educated the public about geography and its important uses. Today's GSC trains students in the latest geospatial technology. Through services such as our community mapping projects, we offer unique educational experiences that harness the power of maps and the integrative tools of geographic information systems, or GIS, uh, to solve environmental and community issues. Together, our board and membership provide education opportunities for students and educators, assist in building geographic materials collections and educational and cultural institutions, promote new and emerging technologies and problem solvings, and much more. If you're familiar with our travelogue series, you know that we normally conduct these presentations in person each month at the Chicago Cultural Center. We can't get together physically at the moment, but the GSC wanted to remain connected with its members and with its supporters. So we have turned our travelogue series into webinars, at least until we get uh, back to a new state of normal. Um, so uh, please make sure to share any feedback you have about the webinar format. Uh, with us today is to, uh, to present is Linda Maynard and she will be speaking on her experience about taking a two-week cruise uh, from Baltimore, Maryland to Jacksonville, Florida on a small ship. A few stops you can expect, expect along the way are Yorktown, Virginia uh, and Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. You will learn the history of some small islands further south and take in beautiful scenery and many sunset views. There will also be the experience of riding on a shrimp boat. Before we begin, uh, let me note that we will have a question and answer period following Linda's presentation. So if you look at your screen, you'll see the Q&A button at the bottom. Um, and if you have a question for Linda, please go ahead and type it into that chat window. And after the presentation, we will answer as many questions as time allows. Um, so with that, I will pass things over to Linda for today's presentation. Thank you so much for being here, Linda. Thank you. Um, I am happy to be here. I'm not sure, am I on? <laughs> I don't know how to do this, right? I can hear you, um, and I just sent a request to start your video. If okay. that doesn't work, you can go down to- um, There we go. <laughs> Hi. Okay, yes, so I'll share my screen so you can see what I have. And I'll put it into play, okay. So yes, as it was uh, introduced, um, we will start in Baltimore and we will end up in Jacksonville. So this is the basic, the, you can see the basic places will be. What I wish I had done instead of this kind of a map is actually a map of all the little uh, waterways that we actually used, but too late now. So this is my ship. It's the Independence. I think it's probably the third or fourth cruise I've taken on that one. And um, in leaving the Baltimore Harbor, of course, we had to pass Fort McHenry, Fort McHenry excuse me. And uh, to refresh your memory, that's where Francis Scott Key wrote the poem that later was set to music and now is our national anthem. So it was a beautiful day. This is in November and early November, and um, the three pictures on this slide represent, show you what the uh, skyline of Baltimore looks like. This is Rachel, and she is our, um, she did history, she did geography, and a lot of other things that she probably wasn't paid to do, and um, just kept us so informed. It was nice uh, to be able to talk to somebody almost anytime you wanted. So we set out from Baltimore around noon and cruised. And our first stop is going to be Yorktown. Uh, this is just getting to be sunset. Woke up and here is Yorktown. And these pictures do uh, a, a fairly good, um, give you a fairly good shot of the two tiers of Yorktown and on the beach uh, water level that was commerce and, and fishing industry and things like that back in um, colonial times. And then on the upper level, those were the homes and the shops. And um, there's not a lot of fishing industry there. And there are some 
uh, apartments being built and stuff, but it's still kind of the way it is. All the shops and the residences are up in town. <clears throat> So we had choices that day. Uh, some people took the bus and went over, uh, went up into uh, Colonial Williamsburg. I chose not to do that. I've been there, done that several times. Um, I chose to stay in Yorktown and kind of wander around and do my own thing. Uh, my first wander was over to the battlefield. I was a teacher. And um, some of you might be familiar with Judy Bach, who's part of the GSC. Uh, we took kids on yellow school buses, drove from Lake Villa, Illinois, to points in Virginia, and did colonial and uh, Civil War spots. So Yorktown was one of our big spots. However, I had never been on this part of the battlefield. We were more on the readouts and not this part. So here you can actually see the York River um, and you can see the bridge, which Cornwallis might have liked to have had on that faithful battle, battlefield, battle bay, um, when he had to surrender. So our ranger who did the talk is this lady here, um, fantastic speaker. She was an excellent, excellent wealth of knowledge. And um, I liked the way she dealt with some uh, school age group kids that were there, some like, I guess, maybe seventh and eighth graders perhaps. And um, she didn't like they were, the way they were acting. So she told them about it and they changed their behavior. <laughs> so it made me feel good. Um, she set the scene up where we are, uh, with the river behind her, there was a big drop off. And she explained that all of, around this plot of land uh, were ravines that would make it very difficult for any army um, and especially any um, artillery to get to that spot where the battle took place. In the picture on the right, if you look, I hope you're looking on a computer and not on a phone, but if you look hard, you can see past the brown grass tops, right around that tree, kind of, the tree is in front of it, but not, but you can see a bit of green and it's in a circular shape and that's what a readout is. And that, that happens to be readout number nine. And a readout is, um, in this case, is a big circle of earth with uh, an indentation in the center for the men to fight from and um, a big ditch around the whole thing. And um, then it had, and Judy looked it up for me and now I can't, crazies I think is what it's called which looked like big logs that have been in a pencil sharpener and stuck in the earthworks. So that if you were an enemy and you were trying to take this readout, you would have to go down and back up and around these pointy things while people were shooting at you. So it didn't happen. If you are a Hamilton musical uh, fan, both Hamilton and Lafayette, were very important at readout nine and readout 10. And um, they helped send Cornwallis packing. What we did with our students after they had had some inside and quieter education on the battle is, and the life at that time, would take them over to this readout number nine, talk to them about how it worked. And then before we put them back on the school bus, we had, they had a race from readout nine to readout 10. So that was always a highlight of their day at Yorktown. Okay, this is back, still in Yorktown, uh, looking at um, their waterfront. It's kind of an interesting uh, um, array of vessels there. This was, like I said, in November. So you see all the beautiful mums. Um, it's just was just gorgeous. This day was perfect. Next, we went to Norfolk. Um, didn't take us very long to get there. 
Um, but we had a choice of various things to do. And my choice was to um, get on the bus and um, take a bus tour around the Navy base. And then um, the other part of our tour was this church. Well, we did get on the bus and we did go to the Navy base. Then um, we all had to get off the bus and they use those great big dental tools, those mirrors that look like dental mirrors <laughs> to look under the bus to make sure we weren't going to blow the bus up and ruin something on the Navy base. All the passengers had to go inside and um, be screened. And lo and behold, as soon as we got through the screening, we were at the gift shop. I thought, well, how nice of them to dump us out at a gift shop. I did buy an NCIS t-shirt there though. Uh, no pictures allowed on the Navy base, so um, I don't have any pictures of the Navy base. But we did go, go to St. Paul's uh, Episcopal Church, uh, a very old one in um, Norfolk there. The windows, uh, this is just a few of the ones taken from the inside to the outside. The second one from the left is a um, Tiffany window. And um, they were just beautiful. This is the, the present day pipes for their organ, obviously not colonial. And um, there's a cannonball still stuck in the facade of the church. And the church uh, yard had all these big, I can't remember exactly what kind of oaks they were, but they're huge oaks, just beautiful. And we're leaving Norfolk. So we were leaving Norfolk about 6.20 at night in the evening. And we arrived at our next stop, which is Coin Jock, um, North Carolina. And this is Coin Jock, North Carolina. I think it's all right there. So it has a few houses and of course a restaurant. So I thought I'd give you some geographic uh, perspective. If you look at the top of the map, you see a green star, that's Norfolk. And if you look at the bottom of the map, you see a red star, that's Coin Jock. It takes about, it took us a little over two hours to cruise down there. It takes uh, an hour or so by car. This is another map to help orient you away in a way. Um, the star next to the word coin jock is coin jock. And um, you see that it's on a narrow straight line. Well, that's the Alba, Albemarle, I can't say this, it's a county, Albemarle and Chesapeake Canal. It's part of the Intracoastal uh, Waterway. And one more, this is not my photo, I didn't fly up and take it. Um, but the lighted uh, circle there, that's where our ship was. And so after we visited here, it would turn around and head back out. Um, this is uh, Kitty Hawk. This is uh, the big reason for stopping in Coin Jock in the first place. This is the uh, memorial to the brothers. It sits atop a big hill. This is the, the front of the museum. The museum is quite nice. It's a perfect size. You can get through it. You can read almost everything and still have time and your brain isn't overflowing. This is still inside the museum and it um, shows you the relationship and the size of, of this um, museum uh, campus. So there's very sandy um, being here next to the intercoastal waterway. It's very, very sandy soil. So they couldn't use wheels like you would if you had a paved or a harder surface. So they put the plane on that monorail, that track you see on the left hand side, and they slid it along that to get the lift. And then you can see in the center um, photo that
that there are four markers and that marks the length of four different flights. So this provided, you know, you could do a nice little walk around this um, museum campus. This is a plaque on the left that shows actual pictures of where the brothers uh, spent their time when they were in Kitty Hawk. Um, pretty meager. The picture on the right is an actual reproduction of what would have been there when they were there, of what they would have built. So you can see uh, bronze um, of their faces, their heads. And then um, this is on the back side of the big Memorial Hill. There's this big bronze plane that was actual size. It was incredible. Um, then we left Quenchock and we were on our way to Beaufort, North Carolina. Now it's Beaufort. In South Carolina, there's a Beaufort. I was told you have to keep it straight. Okay, this is in Beaufort. Um, the big picture is what I got to wake up and look out of my stateroom door to see. It was beautiful. The tugs were coming in from uh, around that land that's in the big picture and it, they ended up, I didn't see it, but they ended up escorting a big um, Navy ship out. Okay, here we are, Beaufort. Uh, this was a bus uh, tour and then we did end up in town. Um, of course, as we were going on the tour, they were telling exactly what kind of architectural styles each one of these is, and so on and so forth, but I was not taking notes. Um, I do know that the house on the left is, has a sample of a Beaufort fence, and the little, um, I don't know, upside down scallops. Um, oops, did I miss one? Yeah, here, oh, no I didn't, sorry. These are two Sears houses. Back in the day, you could um, order from the catalog a Sears house and it would come in trucks and it would get built. And these two are still in very good shape. And here's another house and another sample of the Beaufort fence. This is a cemetery in Beaufort, and um, we stopped because there's always stories about different people in the, <laughs> in the cemetery. And the, the picture on the left um, is, the, is a grave site of a privateer, and they, his sons did not feel like it, it, they did him justice when they put him in the ground the first time. So they built a new um, monument to him with a big uh, um, cannon on the top of it. The center one is of a young girl's grave. Her father had taken her to England, promised that, she, that he would bring her home, but she died on the ship on the way back. And so in order to preserve her, he put her in a, a keg of whiskey and was indeed able to bring her back and um, bury her in Beaufort. So the children, when they come by, um, leave her little goodies, necklaces and, and trinkets and stuff. What I thought was interesting is in the trees above these graves, these ferns are growing along the tops of the branches. It was the most amazing thing. I don't know if it's harmful to the tree, it didn't seem to be, but it, I've, I saw it here and I saw it actually in another cemetery. <laughs> this is, um, we are off the bus and in an apothecary. This is an actual building that was the apothecary for the town and most of the um, artifacts in there are artifacts from that particular apothecary. And then there's an exam table there. Not sure how comfortable that would be. I'm glad that we've uh, progressed somewhat in our 
medical knowledge since then. Okay, we are headed out of Beaufort and we are headed to Wilmington. The tree on the left is a, a sample of one of the great big magnolia trees that uh, a Mrs. Bellamy planted. She planted several of them on their um, mansion's property so she and her children could play in the shade outside. And here we are, the Bellamy man uh, Mansion. Uh, none of these is the mansion itself. The mansion is in the background of this slide. Uh, but these are the slave quarters that you see. And at the door on the right, the open door on the right hand side of the building is <laughs> the door to the privy. And this is not the first um, three, four or five hold privy that I've seen in my travels in the Southwest. Uh, I, I just can't quite picture how that might all work. But um, the two that are uh, at the end are actually smaller. So the children hopefully won't fall in. So on this particular day, I chose to break away from the group. Um, I had traveled a couple of weeks earlier to Wilmington with our teachers group. Uh, we meet once a year somewhere and it was in Wilmington. So some of these pictures are actually from that trip. Um, and that's when I did a lot of my touring of, William, of Wilmington and not on my cruise. So I met some friends for lunch for my cruise. This is their, either their courthouse or their um, town hall, and I can't remember which, but I like the architecture of it. And Wilmington does have a tourist trade. They have a couple of neat ways to go to see things. They have a horse-drawn um, trolley, and they have the motorized trolley, and both of them do a good job. They also have walking tours. And our um, teachers group did the walking tour with this particular lady who's in the black period costume. And she did a marvelous job. And lo and behold, when I got on the bus to take the tour in Wilmington with the crews, there she was again. So they got a very good tour. I am including just some pictures that I took um, and have no real narrative because again, I wasn't taking notes. The um, thing on a pedestal is a drinking fountain. And I do know that the big part is for a horse, a small part for like a dog or something. And if memory serves me, there might be a place for humans to, to get a drink as well. This uh, is just another house. This one is actually another mansion that you can tour. Okay, um, this is the Annie Winstead house. Um, it was um, built and a, a woman lived in it and she was a teacher there in Wilmington for 37 years. God bless her. These two houses are twin houses. Um, they're footprint, their architecture, their, um, you know, the blueprint is all exactly the same, except for the finishing touches. Um, why they chose so differently, I don't know, but they were built by a father for his two daughters. And this is um, what was an old livery and now has been converted into condos and apartments. You can see the front of the old livery stable there. Okay, these videos um, show, this is what the water looked like when we we're coming uh, into Charleston. And the other one is just a view of the marina where the ship was um, tied. Lots of boats. A little windy. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, so um, these are, <laughs> this is a marina. My ship is behind this boat. I have never seen in my life, and I've seen a lot of boats, a boat with five outboard motors on it. It would be interesting to know why. There was nobody there to ask, but I'd kind of like to see what it, how fast it went. <laughs> um, I like to look at the boats, so I took a little walking tour and took pictures as we left. This is obviously a commercial tourist boat. I'm not sure about that one, but then we get down to something that somebody might be able to afford. I kind of like that one. Not a sailor, but I like the looks of the sailboat. They make a pretty picture. It's too modern for me. And now this one, it, I could maybe think about that one. And um, then we're getting ready to leave. <laughs> this is outside my stateroom. Another sailboat. We're cruising out. And this is a, a marshy island area. Um, it's in the Ashley River. There are at least three rivers that come into Charleston. And so our, our guide at one point said, oh yes, there's a famous plantation there. And she may have even mentioned it, but you know what? I could not find anything about it in trying to go back and research it. So <laughs> I don't know what it was. I found lots of places where you could go visit plantations now. I found places that were named plantation something so you could buy a house there, but no answers. Um, here's a, a map and you can see that there are at least three rivers around um, Charleston. And I don't know in our cruise to our next stop um, <laughs> if we took any of them. So here we have more just, just pretty things to look at as we cruised by. We had to go through a drawbridge and I'll be darned if when we went through, he didn't get, the captain didn't get a little bit close and we bumped those wooden things on the, on the port side. It was a little surprising. More scenery. Look at this house, a huge screened yard, screened room, balconies, holy cow. Of course, you didn't see anybody <laughs> in any of these houses. So I don't know where they are. And here's the ultimate, a pool right next to the waterway. Another pool next to the waterway. And here we're getting ready to, uh, you know, travel for the evening. Another sunset. Never gets old for me to watch the sunsets. This is um, a shot from a bus <laughs> in Beaufort, South Carolina. And on this trip, we learned, uh, this was probably the best day for me on the whole trip. Um, the, when I was teaching, I, we taught colonial, we got Amer taught American history, colonial and civil war. And so, you know, I've learned quite a bit about it, having to teach it. And this lesson today was um, something I hadn't ever seen. So we visited St. Helen. St. Helena is an island um, and they're called Lowland Islands. And in the left-hand picture, you see our guide for the day. She was absolutely fabulous. She wore the clothing of the period um, and at any time would drop into um, kind of the sound of her interpretation of the sound of the way people would speak and, and the language they would use. So she was just a wealth. Um, she taught us about the Gala people and their language. And the Gala people are uh, Africans. They had been enslaved in, on this island and on many of the um, barrier islands or the lowland islands 
um, along the coast. So this was just one sample. And they might also be called Geechee, and that name is derived from the Ogeechee River, which is in Savannah, or near Savannah. And their language was called Creole language. Now I had to look it up because the only thing I know about Creole language is affiliated with New Orleans. So the definition of a Creole language is a natural language, <laughs> easy for me to say, a natural language that develops from the simplifying and mixing of different languages into a new one within a fairly brief um, period of time. So that's the meaning of that. So they would have their African language and whatever else, uh, you know, the, the English spoke and who knows mixed with French or something else and would come up with their own language. And so our first stop was at this Chapel of Ease, which um, burned a long time ago, but it was built in the colonial times. Um, and the construction was very different than anything I had seen. Here's another shot. And you can see this stone wall in the foreground. This is called tabby concrete. And tabby concrete is made with um, burned oyster shells and you mix, that creates lime, and you mix the oyster shells with water and sand and ash and more broken oyster shells and mix it all together and that's your concrete. So um, the settlers from Spain used um, this kind of construction very early in what's now our North Carolina and Florida. And then the British began to use it in on the coast here in South Carolina and Georgia. So here's Tabby. This is for a wall. This wasn't part of the church proper. You can actually, you know, you can see all the oyster shells in there. And then, whoops, I went backwards, sorry. Um, and then this is a photo of an inside corner of the church. You can see where um, there's some, looks like soot up by the bricks. And you can see where there's smoothness there, where they've put some kind of a plaster coating over the rough tabby concrete. But the whole base of that was a con concrete was this tabby. Um, you can see um, how old these all look. There's the mausoleum. It's kind of creepy. It was open. There was nothing, nothing in there, but kind of creepy anyway. There's a fenced area where um, a family plot was. And then we got back on the bus and we drove by this uh, uh, Gala only burial grounds. So that the Gala people and their ancestors are the only ones who can be buried here. Now this is a plantation. It's the you know of on the on the island here, and um, it was a very successful uh, coastal plantation. And um, this coffin was inherited this property from his father-in-law, and along with the 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 property, he also inherited like forty-six um, slaves. And they did very, very well. And by the time it was in the, uh, oh gosh, I can't remember the date, I'm sorry. But by the time um, the Civil War came around, this plantation had 260 enslaved people. This is not like most of the Gala uh, plantations because it was not handed down. What happened, I'm sorry, I, I left out a step. Sorry. When the Civil War got close, um, the plantation owners and their families and probably the house servants uh, fled. They fled to safety. They didn't want to be involved. Uh, you know, many of them did not come back. So as time went on, the Africans who were left 
split, they, you know, bonded together, banded together and uh, split the property and um, began creating their own culture, their own communities. And so um, with the, on, the, on St. Helena Island, they did have the help of some very generous um, white donors and they developed a school and the school started with very young children, taught them academics. And then as the kids got older, they not only continued to learn academics, but they began to learn things that would be practical in life. And by the time they got to high school age, they um, were learning tools of the trade so they could go out and make a living and um, run a household and be part of their community and their government. So this particular um, plantation did not get passed down that way. It actually was sold to somebody from the north and um, continued and, and now well, it's no longer a plantation, but it's, <laughs> um, but it, the house is still standing. This is um, the, the praise house, the meeting house, and it's a tiny little place, and this was for the Gala people. Um, there are pictures all around of um, drawings and things of, of people who would have been there. Obviously, the sign in the center is not of uh, colonial or, or even Civil War era, but um, it, it helps their little um, basket there. So um, our guide did what I think is a marvelous job of showing us, demonstrating what part of one of their prayer meetings might have been like. So the next slide is a video and she um, begins with what they would use as a call to worship and then she goes into a little bit more. And I, I hope you found this as, as educational as I did. There's a meeting here tonight. I hope to meet again. I got the word out. They come on in the room. Now, I'm gonna teach you a song that was taught to me by Mary. She's on the back photo back there, so you can get a picture of her and Mr. Middleton. Come on in the room. I'm going to sing it first. Y'all going to bring up the row behind me, okay? But I do need a beat that always clapping and stomping and singing in the praise house. So, get a beat going. No drums were loud, but they would clap. Come on, you crew. Come on, you crew. Come on, you crew. And me right up on my prescription. And he can make all my best in the prayer room. You got that now? Right. And that's how she did it. So um, I, like I said, thoroughly enjoyed the day. We take off again. Uh, we have passed the Paris Island Marine Base. Again, more pretty pictures. And this time we are, um, oh, by the way, the one on the right is for sale. Um, <laughs> we are on our way to Hilton Head. That's just beautiful, beautiful. Hilton Head, it's very touristy. Um, we had to anchor out because the little marina, the little harbor is tiny and there was no room for us. This is a, a, a seawall of seagulls. No, I'm sorry, not seagulls, pelicans. And I did take a little dolphin tour. So some of these pictures are on the dolphin tour and some of these pictures were taken from my little balcony um, of the dolphin. So on the left, you can see pilings and the pilings show you that we are not at high tide at the moment. Um, and I think the tide was still going out. And then there's a shot of a cormorant. Dolphin, we saw bunches, or we saw the same ones bunches of times. So some of the dolphins in, in this area were a kind of a permanent resident group, and then there was a pod that was kind of uh, there for the summer. 
Now, the man that took us on our cruise could identify um, the dolphin by some of the scratches on their backs, their scars, and the way their dorsal fin looked. Now, this dorsal fin does look very different from the one before it. It's got a big hook, it kind of lays over to one side. Um, the little boat, that's what we took our, our dolphin cruise in. Here's three of them. And the, the fins do look very different for each one. Okay, this is a very leisurely day for me. I went in, did the cruise, um, came back out and hung out watching for more dolphin and taking pictures of things as, as they went by my room. Um, I'm a sucker for sailboats, especially when they're under sail. This is a picture of um, the um, launch that takes us in and out. And there it goes to get somebody, not me. I thought when I saw this picture for the first time on the computer, as opposed to, you know, the viewer, it looks almost like a, like a jigsaw puzzle or a painting or something. We're leaving Hilton Head. Um, this is a view just south of, well, not, yeah, just south of the lighthouse. And this is the, the original Hilton Head Resort. So again, going out, lovely things to see. Another beautiful sunset. The house on the right, has its own private um, lighthouse. Full moon that time. More sunset, sunset, sunset. This is Savannah, Georgia. Um, we're headed into where there's more um, modern high buildings, but this is the beginning. Another look at the moon, We've got some clouds going on there. And this is about where we ended up stopping. So good morning, Savannah. We have a fountain that depicts the, you know, vessels, the water vessels used to bring things in and take things out. The right hand side is the Savannah um, World War II monument, um, depicting a world splitting split in half. On the left, it's a closer view of that. On the right is an old house made out of ballast stones. And the ballast stones are um, those that came over in the ships a long time ago. Um, from Europe and especially England. And when they got here, they took them all out and tossed them ashore so they could refill with cotton and other kinds of products they took back to England. So they put those ballast stones to lots and lots of use, especially um, in Savannah, you'll see them a lot. This was tug activity as we started our walking tour. Behind the red tug is the convention center. They have uh, along the waterfront there, a museum to African-Americans um, and all that they've contributed to uh, all of Savannah. And that was erected in 1974. This is City Hall, uh, gold leaf. Uh, on the right hand picture, you can see one of the streets that goes perpendicular to uh, the river. So that's going up towards City Hall. In the picture on the left, you see um, this is the street right on uh, right at the river side. So the, on the left side of the trees, you would have, well, it's not a bank, but it's, you know, cement. <laughs> you have the river's edge. And those buildings, on the right are very tall buildings so that their uh, bottom floor here is at water's 
you know, water's level. And the next story up is um, their front doors are on the next level up, which is a level that Savannah was originally built on, all their houses and, um, and um, businesses. The streets you can see are all the cobbles and the ballast stones. They're with a few brick, it makes it much easier to walk all along. So the street on the left is parallel to the river. The street on the right is perpendicular to the river. These are the caves. Um, at some point, so above that is where you see the railing. That is a level on which Savannah was built. And the wall there started um, eroding and they hired an architect named Kluski to build a wall to, oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that, to protect and keep the erosion from happening. Well, he countered with the idea of building these caves, which would also fit the bill of holding the erosion at bay, but then also provide storage for things. So they said, okay, you build them, you design them, you build them, and then you can have all the rent that you can get for them. And um, that's what he did. So the rooms are, are the the rooms are arched. There's a picture soon to to uh, show that. And there were originally there were four of them. And so the use of the vaults do date back at least to the Civil War. And some of the uses they believe uh, field hospital, stable, trash pits, coal storage. There was also uh, another idea that those one or more of the vaults had been used um, to hold slaves. They did some um, architectural research and they found no evidence of that in their digging. So there are um, panels here along the way to explain what was going on and, and um, what happened. So it talked about the bluff itself and it talked about um, you know how they might be used and things like that and um, it shows d the digging and then it talks about uh, I want to say McCluskey, Kluski himself. So on the left you can see the curved ceilings as well as the the arched um, entries and again you can see on the right hand picture too of course Rachel is right there telling us what we need to know. Okay, this is a building um, that was the old cotton exchange. Um, the back of it would be one story lower and it could be entered from the uh, river side. And did you see two million bales of cotton could come through there in a year when it was big time. The beautiful, beautiful detail, copper gutters, um, I, I guess that's what are flower pots made out of? Anyway, I know you can't answer me, but <laughs> a terraza or something like that. No, that's not it. Terracotta, that's it. Um, you know, they have um, capitals and columns without them being round. I thought that was interesting. Ionic capitals, it was just beautiful. Um, after it ceased being the cotton exchange, it came to be a Freemasons hall. Um, and after that, it, it, it was, when I looked it up to get ready for this, I found that it was supposedly the Chamber of Commerce um, headquarters for Savannah. But when we were there, it didn't look very much like business, it's got a chain around the, around the doors, so I don't know. Um, but it's a beautiful building. So again, looking at this, this street is parallel to the river. It's made out of that ballast stone. The buildings on the right uh, would be one level up from the river. Their, their foundations and, you know, I don't know, basements, whatever, 
would be opening out onto the riverside. The bridge would take you over to the Savannah um, level. So the people from the Cotton Exchange and other businesses there would stand out uh, on that balcony and watch as the um, drays would bring cotton past and you know they could double check the quality and whatever they do <laughs> and send them on their way to the appropriate places. Okay, this is another building, not quite so old, but I thought the architecture was interesting. And this is yet another building, and I don't remember what it was, but I just loved the detail on the top of it. And I, it looks to me, I don't remember from memory, but that almost looks like metal. But I thought it was an interesting application of the dart, egg and dart and the dentals. Okay, back now to the same level that the cotton exchange is on. These are some other um, doorways and businesses. So there are uh, businesses and restaurants and um, other little shops along that line. Again, this is looking down to where the drays of cotton might be, the cobbles. And then you can see across where the cars are and the bases to some other buildings, you can see um, the level that Savannah would be on. Okay, this is interesting. Why are the X's on the building? Because they're holding the building stable. They would go through to the other end. There'd be similar X's on the other end. This is uh, a street that's obviously per uh, perpendicular to the river and uh, another arched bridge that goes across and in the highlighted area um, across the river is again another shot of the convention hall and um, it also has an arch to it. Okay, hey, this uh, is John Wesley, a tribute to him on the left. He um, was uh, very present in uh, things around Savannah. What's interesting um, on this page is the bricks on the right are considered um, inferior quality. Now this is on a front porch, so you, you can see the base of a, of a um, pillar and you'd go around and climb the steps and there might be a garden entrance down at where I'm standing. But anyway, this, the bricks were considered uh, inferior bricks. They weren't quite red enough and they were uh, um, made, manufactured locally. So <laughs> that was, <laughs> the local bricks are not good enough. Okay, this house has an interesting, um, some interesting um, information. Um, a free black woman by the name of Mrs. DeVoe, not the DeVoe or that I think is in the New Orleans, there's a DeVoe. This lady um, was a baker and she liked to offer children in the neighborhood, the other black children, um, lessons in baking. So they got in there and she probably did teach them some baking, but what she also did was spread flour on the tabletop and taught them letters and numbers and reading and writing. And, you know, nobody would ever know because then they ate their evidence, I guess. Okay, this is the front of her house. It shows when it was built and the name of the builder. This is, uh, on the left is, um, part of the fire, a fire department. There were very, you know, there were often many fire departments in a town like this. And they had this lookout tower on um, the upper floors of their fire department so that a fireman could stand and look out and maybe get a head start on seeing smoke. Otherwise, the fire would start, somebody would have to run over to the fire department, they'd have to, you know, get their stuff together and it would take longer. 
On the right is just a very, I thought a very interesting door handle. I have no real idea. It was supposedly on a building and inside there were Coca-Cola signs, but supposedly those signs were from the time when there was actually cocaine in the beverage. I have no idea. These are two just fantastic houses in um, Savannah and they're patty corner from each other. Um, on the left is a Davenport house and he, he designed and built it for his wife. He was a builder. He had an office down by the river. And so one winter day, she decided to take him lunch, accidentally fell into the river and because she had so many extra clothes on, she drowned. He used the house, however, to kind of as a catalog for things that are possible. And so if you look, and there, I have some shots of things. You, if you look at it, um, there are many fancy things that are kind of over and above what people might do. The house on the right um, was a very nice mansion. And um, over the years, it became other things besides a mansion. It was a funeral home for a while. And at one point, Joe Namath purchased that property and wanted to turn it into a gentleman's club. Uh, the town turned him down. They wouldn't let him build. So then the building sat empty for a while until it came was bought and now is a very upscale b and This is back to the Davenport house. Uh, here's one of the fancier things. How would you like the rainwater to come out of the mouth of a fish? I think we all need one of those. On the stairs, a built-in boot cleaner. I think we all need one of those. And then this beautiful, it really is beautiful, curly Q wrought iron work. It's fantastic. Um, this plaque explains, um, they called them gates back when the uh, town, when Savannah was new. And this just explains how, what that meant and, and um, kind of how the whole place was laid out and the importance of Davenport. Okay, now this is the Joe Namath house, which they've named Kehoe now. Its front has excellent beveled glass. It's just beautiful. You can go on the internet today and um, there are lots and lots of pictures of the inside since it's a B&B. &B. This is another house. Um, the Owens Thomas house, and this is it. And what I thought was interesting about this house is the fact that the architect uh, designed it and had the designs accepted before he was the age of 21. Seems pretty fantastic. Uh, it's now a museum. The, the building that's visible now is not what was originally built. This is built, this newer construction, although it's old, is actually built on a tabby foundation, which they wouldn't have used when they did build this building. Okay, Tomo Chichi, Chichi is a Native American and um, he, with uh, Oglethorpe, um, was considered to be part of the, you know, instrumental in uh, settling in, in um, Savannah and Georgia. So they built, they buried him in this, if you've been to Savannah, you know it has frequent little, what looked like, square, what are squares, but might be considered parks. So they buried him in the middle of one of these and then lo and behold, at some point, they built a bigger monument over his, over his grave. Well, the people didn't like that. They thought he was too important. So they have a big granite stone. It's huge, it's way bigger, taller than I am. Ha, you can't tell how tall it is, can you? Um, <laughs> anyway, and so they've recommemorated that portion. We are leaving Savannah. It's fairly early morning, and those are egrets, not decorations, but egrets, still sleeping. And um, 
here we have more houses along the way. So there was a hurricane several years ago that um, somehow made the bridge that you see that the drawbridge um, unusable. So for several cruise trips, many cruise trips, they've had to take whatever a different way around and weren't able to use this inland waterway portion. So Rachel was ecstatic that we got to take this part because it's real pretty. So we have the old bridge that is drawn in the distance and the new bridge, which is built tall enough so that you can actually just take the ship underneath. You can see the gears for the drawbridge. And then we're looking back on the left-hand side, there's still some work being done. So they have a barge there. Another house, big screen rooms. Now this looks weird because that really was still, it wasn't sundown or sunrise. It was in the middle of the day. Okay, this is just a quick video of part of our trip from Savannah. Okay, we went to St. Simon Island. Um, it's, here's its lighthouse and um, the building underneath is a mass, lighthouse masters. It's a museum now. Uh, part of it we were able to walk and this part took us on a bus to this beautiful church and it's got huge trees and this does have Spanish moss on those trees. So we were able to go inside, it's you know, all wood. The pew that you see on the um, left picture any of the pews in that building that had these little crosses on the ends, those were original. Uh, then there was a fire, so being wood, a lot of them were lost. And um, you can see how the inside is still all wood. Outside, we have the Dodge family. Um, Mr. Dodge was uh, instrumental in helping to rebuild the church to what it is now. So he's buried um, with his marker being the big cross. And he had two wives, not at the same time, and they were buried on either side of him. And then he did lose one child as an infant or toddler and that marker is the small cross. The women were treated a little bit better than dad. I don't know what happened there. Old, old, old church. Uh, it's a burial ground in the church. Um, just so different. The one on the left is of a, of a young child. And the ones, you know, you've got, they're just all so, so many all shapes and sizes. This is at the visitor center in um, at St. Simon, and they have um, tree spirits. So various places around the island, these tree spirits have been carved into the trees. And this one is the mermaid tree spirit. I walked out to um, not very far from the tree spirit, so I could see out into the ocean there and um, this is a shipping canal and at some point in the not too well it was not too dis, dis, not too distant to past in November <laughs> um, a ship full of cars had not been loaded well and the the cars shifted and the captain knew the ship was gonna capsize so he moved it out of the main part of the shipping canal so it could still be used. So what we're looking at in the big picture is the top of um, this uh, big freighter. And then of course the sailboat. 
wasn't a very nice day. This is um, a look at the bottom of the, the ship. You can see all the red and then the, the barge in front of it in, is what they're using to try to stabilize the ship so it's safe to go and then offload the fuel and offload the cars so that at some point um, it can be gotten taken away. Okay, this is an interesting um, piece of statuary and it's all garbage, <laughs> recyclables, um, shaped like a dolphin. This is the um, shrimp boat that I went on. It was part of our part of our you know, cruise. And um, it was quite interesting. Now this shrimp boat stayed in, in the channels. Most of the other shrimp, I mean, the real commercial shrimp boats had to go out past the, um, past the islands and do their shrimping. This had a naturalist aboard and was purely educational. They did not keep any of the things they found. So here we are. Um, uh, the left shows the heavy weights and the 20 foot nets in the trough on the right. And you'll see another shot of it later is something they can put on the nets to prevent larger animals like horseshoe crabs and big turtles and so on and so forth from getting in the shrimp nets. All they want is shrimp. They don't want any of this other stuff. So there's the weight. There's the um, um, chains that hold the net. Uh, there's a shot on the left of uh, the net is behind us. And the naturalist in the right is showing what that device looks like that is normally put in the mouth of the netting so that these, you know, all they get, or hopefully all they get is shrimp. Okay, on the um, left, you can see. Okay, we'll get up the creek a little bit before we slow the boat down. And Okay, he was just going to let it go out behind the boat. Then they would slow the boat down to actually try to pick up the um, to pick up life from the from the water. He's bringing it in. goes on for a little bit but I'm going to quicken it up. Um, the naturalist in the picture on the left has another apparatus that can be put on to, to again um, keep things you don't want um, from getting in the nets. They did catch a long nose gar and um, the scales on the gar are much different than most fish that um, normal people would be familiar with it. They're very, very tightly packed. They don't seem to be lying on top of one another. Obviously, the gars have huge, sharp teeth. And that's a sea lice on the left. It's attached itself to the, um, to one of the fins of that gar. Um, and it's just a parasite that rides along. Um, we did catch a uh, horseshoe crab, and that's what it looks like. Horseshoe crabs are more closely related to spiders than they are to crabs. 
they use that uh, tail as a tool. So if they happen to get on, you know, uh, on their back or whatever, it can be used to flip themselves right. Um, the feet underneath are used, um, let me get this straight. They are used for propulsion and um, eating, but they really aren't used for pinching. Don't scare me, I don't need to see it. The top picture, the man's finger is pointed toward the mouth of the um, crab. And in the bottom picture, that's his gills. And those are known as feather gills. Here we have a um, stingray. And uh, it is... Um, the tummy, the underside, is very, very sensitive. And so you can see the netting marks um, on its flesh there. According to the naturalist, that will disperse and go away. And they'll, of course, put him back in the water. Um, and then you can see the top of the, top of the um, ray. Uh, two types of feeding feet, two different ways these fish can feed. The one on the left is feeds off the bottom, so you can see the way his face and nose and snout and mouth are aimed. The other fish just swims along and grabs things in as they float in front of him. These are one-sided fish, flat fish. The one on the right is a, um, sure, what's that called? Anyway, as it, as it grows, um, when it starts, it's, it's eyes, it has one eye on each side, and um, it's a flounder, one eye on each side. And when it grows and goes through its metamorphosis, those one eye travels over to the other side. <laughs> and then we have one more flatfish, and this uh, kind only gets about as big as it is, about size of the palm of his hand, not very big. Okay, finally, we have a shrimp. The shrimp have a big, long antenna, and those um, kind of float around them, and they pick up things like the salinity of the water, temperature of the water, and things like that. Um, the shrimp also have um, spines along the back of the fish or the back of the shrimp he's pointing to them in the middle finger and um the shrimp can go better backward than they can forward and then um you can see how they you know just what they look like so here are four samples the first, the front one, and it is bigger, not just because it's in front, but it's bigger, is a last year's, or the, well, I was there in November, so <laughs> the last year's, and the other ones are from this year, or the, from, oh well, when I was there. <laughs> Got one squid, and that blue crab that we saw, and it was a female. And he, the way he can tell is because it's the abdomen is rounded. They're beautiful little animals. This fish is so strange. It has a parasite in its mouth. You can see it looks like a little worm there. And it is the female of the species. And the, the parasite enters the mouth of the fish and eats the fish's tongue. And then that parasite acts as the tongue. And um, so if something happens, the, it, the, then that parasite can change into the opposite sex. It's very strange, very strange. Okay, we are arriving at Jacksonville in this. Um, very foggy. You can see the, the lighthouse on Amelia Island in the picture on the right. Amelia Island is fairly a tourist e, although it wasn't in November. Uh, so, you know, a lot of little shops, little places to eat, and things like that. 
Um, it did end up with the Atlantic's first railroad down there in the Gulf, the man who helped do that. We went by a paper mill, so there's a indication of still some timber work down there. And Jacksonville in the middle of the day on the left <laughs> and at night. Um, it was much clearer at night. So that's the view. This is the end. Rachel's uh, last hand-drawn map. She drew hand-drawn maps often. Um, it's pretty cool. And uh, that's the end of my trip. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Linda. Um, that was some really incredible architecture and sunsets and yeah, so thank you so much for sharing. Um, I might have you uh, stop sharing your screen. Okay, um, here we go. <laughs> so we are on to our questions. Uh, we do have some from our audience right now, but I want to remind everybody that if you have questions right now, feel free to drop them in the Q&A um, tab at the bottom here, and we can still get answers to those. So um, our first one, uh, asks, so you mentioned tourism in various cities. Um, which of these towns did you find to be uh, kind of more tourist oriented um, and which seemed less so? Um, well, Savannah is very touristy. Um, it's got the old part, which is, you know, which a lot of people go to. November was a nice time to go because it was still fairly decent or early November. Um, each, each one had its areas. Wilmington, there was a part that was very touristy, but there's other, of course, it's on the seacoast. People, you know, people need something to do besides be in the ocean when they come for the summer or part of the summer. So each one of them have, has parts, but you don't have to necessarily be there, you know, in that part. Um, so I would say Savannah. Charleston, of course, that's why I spent, I didn't, I went in and did the market in Savannah, or in Charleston, excuse me, but that's all, you know, there wasn't anything else I wanted to see. I'd been there on a vacation, so, um, you know, those two are the biggest ones, the, you know, Yorktown is very small, so, you know, in the summer, it, it does like its tourists, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, it seems like a lot of the industry and a lot of these places kind of relies on that. Um, another question is how many hours per day were spent touring as opposed to uh, cruising on the water? Most days, uh, most times we either arrived at our destination um, the night before uh, the excursion or very early in the morning of the excursion and um so you had most of the day that nothing was very far apart um i was trying to decide yorktown from baltimore to yorktown was probably one of our longest you know strips and that was done overnight hmm. as i recall <laughs> uh, but you have a lot of time on this particular um, itinerary, you have had a lot of time to be on shore. So if you had people that are kind of, you know, anxious and can't sit still very long, need their exercise, they can get off and get it. Because the ship, I mean, you could walk around the deck, but that you'd get pretty dizzy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Another question about the boat. Um, what were the sleeping accommodations? Um, I had a single, which is uh, a twin bed, um, and then um, you have your own bathroom, which was a good size. Um, this, the, the double on that ship, um, you can either have the bed made as two twins, so if, you know, mom, you know, if you're traveling with a girlfriend or, you know, whatever, or you can have it made up as a king-size bed. Um, there's plenty of room for two people to pass around to, you know, get from one side to another without, you know, bumping into each other. Um, the bathroom is, is one person at a time, but <laughs> it's very good. 
So, um, yeah, I've been on that size with this cruise line several times, and it's very nice. Uh, most of them are um, river cruises, and so the, if you're worried about getting seasick, it doesn't usually happen. Yeah. Um, here's another one. Um, how many people were on your cruise? Um, I think we're pretty full. I think 99 passengers can be on the ship. Wow. Um, they're coming out with a whole, well, I don't know what's going to happen now, but <laughs> they were coming out with a, a new series of, of ships that were just, you know, just short of 200 passengers. And I've been on one of those and I prefer the small one. I like the small. Um, here's another one. Your ship looked too big to go down the ICW proper. Uh, was this cruise track designed to specifically handle your ship? Uh, <laughs> it handled it. <laughs> you know, we, it was advertised as an intercoastal waterway. I, you know, I don't think they were lying. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know how to answer that because I assume that they were true. I didn't test them on it. <laughs> it's, you know, it, it really isn't that big of a ship so um if you're what's the ship that goes in and out of you know of, of the river in chicago that um takes you on evening cruises and stuff it was longer than that but it you know i don't know that it was twice that size so it handled it and evidently we were on the intercoastal so maybe there's you know some for you know in individual boats you know like you take your own boat down mm -hmm. uh, was there a stop at st michael's maryland or was it just a marker on the map if you stopped uh what did you find there and what was it known for um we didn't stop I, I thought we were because of the way that map looked. Um, and I think, is that where we would have gone to Annapolis if we'd gone there, I think? But I'm not sure. So I was a little disappointed. I, did, I was kind of looking forward to going to Annapolis. But, you know, they always, they always have a caveat, of, you know, may change at any time. <laughs> uh, the photo in Norfolk showed St. Paul's Episcopal Church. There was a grave marker, um, potentially for Daniel Ferguson, at the base of the church's exterior wall. Was there any significance to that person, or why was the grave marker preserved uh, that you were aware of? The one that looked like it was leaning against the wall, I think is what you're referring to. Um, I, there was no real significance, um, I, and I just took pictures that I thought were interesting, or just used, I took a lot of pictures to just use the pictures that I thought were interesting. So I don't know any of those stories. The um, stories of the, the little girl being preserved in the whiskey on the way back, that was super interesting and devastating too. Yeah. Um, well, otherwise they would have had to bury her at sea. Yeah. You don't want um, somebody just hanging out. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, did the ship have a cook or a chef? I'm wondering if the food was fabulous. It, it was great. Yes, it had a chef. It had, you know, all the bells and whistles. We had inside toilets. No. Um, yes, it was, food was always good. Um, you, when you went to breakfast, there was like a little buffet. So people who didn't want a huge thing, they just wanted a little granola or a little cereal and a little fruit and you need your prunes that were there you know so you could make your own small little breakfast you could start with that and then order off the menu because there's usually a quiche of the day or some egg of the day but then you can order you know eggs any way you want it that kind of thing then at that at there there was a, a a menu and the menu it told you what um was going to be for lunch and what was going to be served for dinner and you put your stateroom and your name on it and you filled it out. And you could also tell them, you could also request anything like a hamburger or whatever. You don't want anything that was on the menu or grilled cheese for your kids if there were kids. Um, or you could say I'm eating um, ashore 
So they just kind of have a basic, you can change your mind too. If you say, oh, I didn't really want that. I want this other one. You can still change your mind, but they just have, want to get some idea. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, and you mentioned uh, hoping to go to Annapolis. Um, this question is, how are the towns along the route chosen? Uh, well, I have no idea. They do the, the that itinerary has been um, in their um, brochure since we started traveling with the, the cruise line years ago. So, you know, I, I kind of, <laughs> you find a good thing. <laughs> if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I don't, you know, it's just, those are interesting points. Um, you know, I was almost, wasn't going to go because I'd been to some of those places before. Uh, but it was, it was fine because you always learn something new, especially Yorktown I'd been to, I don't know, three or four times. I'd never been to the part that I went to on my own. So. Absolutely. See something yeah. new. It seemed like all of those stops were chock full of history um, and stories. And this is our last question here. Um, what was the tour company that organized the trip? You said you had traveled with them before. Um, American Cruise Line. They're out of the East Coast somewhere, but they have itineraries all over. I've done, um, I've done um, river cruises with them up the Hudson. I, our first cruise was probably one of my favorites. It was a lobster cruise off the coast of Maine. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done the, I've done two, I've gone to Alaska on it and I've gone to uh, the, um, sure, the San Juan Islands and whatever that body of water is that's off of Seattle. Um, so yeah. And again, I prefer the 99 passenger ship just because it's just, I, it's easier for me to remember more people. Mm -hmm. So I like it. I don't know that I'll ever go on a cruise again, <laughs> but I think they would do a good job if, you know, keeping things clean. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for all of the information you shared with us today. We really appreciate okay. it, Linda. Um, that will conclude our travelogue presentation. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for attending and for supporting the work of the Geographic Society of Chicago. Uh, our next travelogue will be presented by Debbie Norton in August on her trip to South Africa. So please stay tuned for an official date on that. Um, for information on future travelogues or on how to become a member of the GSC, please visit our website at www.geographicsociety.org. Um, we hope to see you again soon, and thank you so much for coming today, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Linda.